now that we've talked through some of the key concepts of, you know, what is the purpose of predictive models? When should we build predictive models? How should we apply them? And some of the common problems that we run into. Let's actually get into the, you know, details of the step-by-step -step process for actually training a predictive model. So before you do this part of the uh, slides, you should go ahead and install the tidy models package uh, using the install.packages function. Similar to tidyverse, tidy models is a meta package that will install multiple packages on your machine that have to do with predictive modeling. And for the remainder of the machine learning portion of the course, we will be using the tidy models package. So let's go through the steps for training models one by one. The first step is to split your data into a training set and a test set. Um, and this is because we are going to be establishing internal validity. And the most simplistic way that we'll be doing that for the purpose of this course is through holdout validation, where we train our model in the training set and evaluate it on the test set, recognizing that there are other ways that we could establish internal validity as well, involving cross-validation and bootstrapping, for example. We'll then specify predictors, outcomes, and uh, pre-processing steps for our data to prepare the data using the recipe function. We'll then specify the type of model that we want to use, um, as well as the objective of the model. So is it a regression model or a classification model, for example? What is it trying to do? We'll then package the recipe and model into a workflow object. And then we'll actually go on with the kind of final steps, which are to actually train the model in the training set, optionally to tune the model, which we won't do this week, but we will return to in a subsequent lecture, to predict the outcomes on the test set that was uh, not used for training, and to measure the performance of the model on the test set, again, which was not used for training purposes. So let's walk through these one by one. So if you want to follow along, feel free to uh, walk through these steps. The first step we'll be doing is loading the namsys 08 R data file, which will load our kind of sample uh, NAMSYS data that we've been using throughout this course. And then we'll take a look at the patient's data frame, which originates from the NAMSYS 08 file. And the overall objective that we're going to try to achieve today is to predict the insurance type, which is the pay type variable, using all of the other variables in the patient's data frame, or almost all the variables. So here are the variables in the patient data frame. There are 13 variables. We're going to not use ID and we're going to not use visit reason, and we'll go through why. But we'll otherwise use the remaining variables to predict pay type. Um, and what we really want to predict is, is the insurance private or not? Um, and so, for us to be able to do that, we'll need to transform the pay type variable to make it binary from the current way it is where it has multiple different options. So let's go ahead and transform pay type to make it binary. Um, and this is gonna be our outcome variable. So we can do that by making a new data frame called data set. And we'll say data set equals patients, then mutate pay type equals if else, pay type is equal to private insurance, then call it uh, private underscore ints, otherwise call it non-private ints. So essentially Medicare, Medicaid, any other type of insurance 
or lack of insurance will get coded as non-private insurance. So then we can, after we've uh, carried that out, we can group by pay type, summarize n equals n, calculate a proportion, and take a look at what we've got. And what you'll see is that we've got about 14,000 patients without private insurance, uh, 14,500 patients with private insurance, and it's roughly a 50-50 split when we look at uh, the proportions. There's no reason that your outcome has to be a evenly split. In many instances, one of the two uh, categories is much more common than the other. So don't artificially make your outcome be evenly distributed. Um, but I'm just mentioning that here it happens to be the case. Next, let's go ahead and remove the variables that we do not want to include in our model. So I'm going to go ahead and remove ID and remove visit reason. And I'm overwriting our data set variable by assigning that result back to data set. So why shouldn't we include ID? So if you think about it, ID is unique for every patient, and there's no real clear reason why it would have predictive value. Does the ID order actually capture some meaningful information such that you would expect that it would work well or generalize to new patients? It might be the case that uh, smaller ID numbers are more likely to be present in older patients because you know, really, really old uh, or really, really low ID numbers, you know, likely belong to patients who were assigned those IDs a long time ago. But there are direct ways of capturing that by capturing a patient's age. So, you know, we typically wouldn't include ID in our prediction modeling. So any ID variable that you come across in any data set that you have, make sure to remove it before you train a predictive model. Why not include a visit reason? Um, you know, the reason that that patient is there for that visit might very well be important information to know about to be able to predict what kind of insurance they have. There are certain visit reasons that might not be possible with either private or absence of private insurance. But it's a high cardinality predictor, which means that it has many different categories. So, while we could include it in our model, for right now, we're going to avoid it because different models handle high cardinality variables very differently. And until you know more about how the individual models work, it's best to leave out these high cardinality variables until you can decide how best to incorporate them. So for now, any variable that has kind of more than 10 or 15 levels you should essentially plan to exclude it, at least until you have a better understanding of the underlying algorithms and can decide to include it um, you know, intentionally. It turns out that our data has uh, some missingness. So there are values that are missing because we have, I think we had um, something like 10 predictors and one outcome variable after we got rid of ID and visit reason. And for any given patient, one of those 10 predictors might be missing. And so the reason this is a problem is that many models or many model implementations uh, cannot be trained in the presence of missing values. So you either have to fill the missing values in with um, another value in order to be able to proceed or you have to remove rows that contain missing values or remove columns that have high rates of missingness. So we will return to this idea of filling in missing values, which is known as imputing in a later lecture. But for now, we're going to remove all rows containing missing values. And we'll do this by saying data set equals data set, then drop NA. Notice that this removes most of the rows for, of our data set. So this is not a good idea. It's something that I'm doing merely out of convenience for now until we learn how to 
impute in missing values in a later lecture. Okay, so now let's get started. Now that we've created our data set by going through the step-by-step -step list of kind of uh, things we need to do to be able to train our data and then evaluate it. So the first thing we have to do is split our data set into a training cohort and a test cohort. And we can do that by using the initial split function. So you'll notice a couple of different things here. You'll notice that I'm setting the seed and then I'm assigning this initial split back to a, a variable called split data that I'm creating and that I specified a proportion of two thirds, which means that two thirds of the patients will go into the training split and one third will go into the test split or test set. Once I create this split data, I can access either the training or the test set. If I want to access the training set, I can use the training function and uh, put split data inside there and it will return a data frame containing only the training data. And if I want to access the test data, I can use the testing function from tidy models that will return only the testing data. So why did I set a random number seed here? And why did I choose one? Setting a seed ensures that the initial split function, which randomly divides the data, returns the same splits every time. There's no philosophical reason for why you would need to get the same split every time. It's mainly a reason of convenience, which is that it, this ensures that the analysis is reproducible by me and by you. So if I am generating a series of plots downstream, every time I start my computer and open up our studio, I get the same exact result so that I don't have to redo all my tables and figures every time I you know, open up our studio. Similarly, this ensures that if you go ahead and run my code, you should get not just similar results to me, but potentially identical results to me, depending on the type of model that you're developing, because the splits will be the same. So that's why I included the random number seed in there. I commonly just choose a random number seed of one, but you can put any number in there. Um, as long as you're not trying all different numbers just to try to get the best performance out of your model, which has been known to happen in the past. Not in this class, but in the literature. The next step is to specify a recipe that indicates which of the variables in our data set are the predictors, which is the outcome, and identify any important pre-processing steps. So here we'll uh, start with, we'll create a variable called my recipe. And inside that, we'll specify a recipe that looks at our training data and includes a relationship between the outcomes and the predictors in this formula notation. And inside of this recipe function, the formula notation indicates that I want to predict pay type as a function of all other variables, which you can represent with a dot. Let's say I only wanted to use two variables, uh, variable one and variable two, to predict pay type. I could have written here pay type as a function of variable one plus variable two. So that's kind of standard notation in R that we really haven't covered. But the most common way that you'll be doing it is if you can start by selecting out any variables you don't want from your uh, data set, you should be able to always do outcome as a function of dot, which means that every other variable in your data set will be included as a predictor. So to see more details on what my recipe entails, you can type in my recipe and hit enter. Um, and recognize that no modeling has actually happened yet. Um, so when you ran this recipe function, it didn't train your model, it didn't do anything. It just 
memorize the recipe so that when you go to train your model, it knows you know, what is the outcome, what is the predictor, and what it needs to do. It might seem like, why is this called a recipe? And what is the pre-processing steps here? So we haven't learned any pre-processing steps yet. An example of a pre-processing step would be fill in the missing values. Um, but because we haven't gotten to missing values yet, we're not learning about pre-processing steps yet. But learning this notation with creating a recipe will mean that when it's time to impute missing values or do other kinds of transformations, you'll be able to do it inside of uh, this recipe pipeline. Okay, so now that we've got a recipe, we've got to specify a model. So I'm gonna create a new variable called logistic model, and I'll say logistic model equals logistic underscore reg, set engine GLM, set mode classification. So you might be wondering, how did I know to specify logistic underscore reg? Like, what is that? Well, if you go to the Tidy Models website for the Parsnip package, which is the kind of core modeling package, you'll see a list of all the different functions you can use um, for uh, fitting models, for, for classification, regression, uh, and survival. And so for classification, one of the listed models is logistic regression, and it's specified with logistic reg. Engine refers to the uh, type, to the function that you actually want to use or the package you want to use to actually fit the logistic regression model. So in the case of GLM, it actually refers to R's built-in GLM function to fit the logistic model but this is not the only function available for logistic regression modeling. There are several other functions available. And so the whole idea with this notation is that I can say logistic reg, and then I can basically choose any engine of my choice. Um, and behind the scenes, tidy models will convert my code into the appropriate syntax for that engine and run that code appropriately. In the case of logistic regression, it can only be used for classification, so you don't actually need to set the mode. But for some models, they can be used for both regression and classification. And in, that, in those cases, you actually do have to set the mode. So my general practice is to always set the mode. And if the outcome is binary or categorical, always set the mode to classification, even if your model is only available for classification just to prevent errors down the road. So it's optional here because logistic re regression models are always used for classification, but it's a good habit to get into to always specify an engine and always specify a mode. Okay. So just like how I specified a logistic regression model, I could have specified a random forest model. In this case, I'm going to set the engine to Ranger which is a very fast implementation of random forest uh, that uh, performs very well. Random forest can be used both for classification and regression. So here you actually do need to set the mode to classification to make it clear to the uh, to tidy models that you intend to use this ranger implementation for classification. So one thing to note is that this code will only work if you have the uh, Ranger package installed. If you don't have the Ranger package installed, you'll get a message that you need to install the Ranger package. So in many of the instances, the engine actually refers to the package or package function that actually is going to be doing the modeling work for you. So note that Tidy Models itself doesn't come with any models installed in the tidy models package. Instead, tidy models provides a consistent syntax so that you can access models built by others. So when you set the engine to a value, uh, make sure that you have the respective package installed for that engine. 
but also make sure not to library in that package. So even though I had to install Ranger here, I didn't need to library it in. And I typically encourage people not to library in those packages because they may contain functions that end up overriding important tidy models functions, since a lot of predictive modeling packages have overlapping function names. Okay, so now that we've defined our recipe and we've defined our model, we need to package those into a workflow object. And so for a logistic regression model, that workflow object will basically start with a workflow function, pipe it to add recipe my recipe, which is the recipe that I defined, and then add model logistic model, which I just recently defined. And I can do something similar for random forest using the random forest using the same recipe, but also using the random forest model. Okay. And if I take a closer look at this logistic model workflow, you can see that uh, the preprocessor is recipe. The model itself is a logistic regression model. Right now, there's no recipe steps because I haven't done any uh, preprocessing of the data. And you can see that the model is using the GLM engine as in order to do logistic regression. Okay. So the last three things that we need to do is train a model on the training set, predict its performance on the uh, test set, and to actually uh, predict the actual values of the test set in case we want to get back some values. So this should read predict and measure performance on the test set. While there are separate functions I could teach you to do each of those steps, for ease of use, I'm actually going to focus on a single function, which is called last fit. And what this does is it takes a workflow, it takes a data split, and it takes a series of metrics that you want to calculate. And it actually fits the model on the training split, evaluates the model on the test split, and reports back all the performance measures that you ask it to measure. And it saves all the predictions of the trained model on the test split for you. And you have an option to save the training split predictions as well if you want. So again, even though this is like three different steps, you actually carry these out with a single function. And we'll accomplish all these three steps using the last fit function. So you might be wondering just like, why is that function called last fit? So if we had tuned this model, then we would have had to build multiple models using a separate function, which we won't talk about right now. And the idea is, is that if we were doing a bunch of tuning, after we finished tuning, the final thing we would do is we would use the last fit function to fit the data one last time on the test set. Since we're not doing any tuning here, we jump straight from you know, specifying our workflow and our um, uh, uh, data split right to the actual uh, last fit function simply because we're ready to kind of predict on the test set. So think about using the last fit function primarily once you're done with your training set, whether that's just fitting a model, whether that's tuning, and you're ready to predict your performance on the test set for kind of one last time. Hence the name last fit. Okay. So once we have uh, stored that result to logistic results, we can collect the predictions and take a glimpse at them using our tidyverse friendly function of glimpse. And you can see that this is uh, 1,488 observations. And the reason it's that many observations is because that's how many observations are in our test set that was created with the initial split function. And that this data has uh, six variables. And so, it has the um, predicted probabilities uh, of private and non-private insurance that add up to one. So for that first patient, it's predicting 
eighty percent of patient, you know, eighty percent likelihood of being non-private versus nineteen percent likelihood of being private insurance. You can see the row number that's you know that it came from from the original uh, complete data set. Uh, you can see that the predicted class, so the overall prediction for that first patient is non-private insurance. And then you can see what that patient actually had. And in the case of that first patient, the model uh, guessed incorrectly because that patient actually had private insurance. So collect predictions is the key function here. Because the last fit function did the model training and ran the model on the test set, and measure the performance, all we have to do is collect the predictions using the collect predictions function. If we want to know how well the model performed in the test set, we can actually just take the results again and just do collect metrics. And this will tell us for the four metrics that I asked for what the different values are. And so uh, the four values I asked for were accuracy, meaning if you made the model guess exactly uh, whether the patient had ins private insurance or not, it was 64% accurate, at least at a specific uh, threshold of probability, which we'll come back to um, in a subsequent lecture. The kappa score at that threshold was 27, uh, uh, was 0.27. And then the receiver operator curve, error under the curve was 68%, which I don't expect you to know about at this moment, but we'll come back to what that is. And the precision recall error to the curve was 71%, which again, I don't expect you to know what that is, and we'll come back to. I primarily want you to take away from this, how do you define a recipe, choose your model, put it into a workflow, fit uh, that model on the train, training data and then test and then run it on the test data using the last fit function. And then how do you collect the predictions for what the model predicted in the test set and how do you collect the performance measures using the collect metrics function? So I, I really want you to understand the mechanics, not necessarily be able to interpret the numbers on this page, at least yet. So just to refresh, uh, you need to have the tidy models package installed to be able to walk through these uh, code steps and any underlying engines that have different packages associated with them, you may need to install if you don't already have them installed. And then we talk through the steps that you need to go through to actually train your model. The first step is to split your data and, into a training set and test set after you've removed kind of the predictors or the variables that you don't want to include, like the ID. Then you want to specify the predictors that you want to use, the outcome variable, and how you want to prepare your data using any pre-processing steps, which we haven't covered yet, using the recipe function. Then we'll specify the model. We'll package the recipe and model into a workflow object. We'll train the model on the training set only predict the outcomes on the test set, and then measure the performance of the model on the test set. Again, with the idea that this is a way to establish internal validity, since we're really just looking at one data set um, and not we're not looking at external validity or generalizability at this point. Uh, and we probably won't look at it in this course. So I hope that's helpful as a place to get started. I know we covered a lot. Um, and so, you know, as you understand the concepts better, we will have a series of lectures describing individual models and we'll revisit the idea of tuning and how to handle missing values.